Futures Radio Show, sponsored by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world effectively manage risk. For access to free educational tools and resources for the active individual trader, please visit activetrader.cmegroup.com. Com. Every day, traders and investors dive in to tackle the ever-changing markets to find opportunity. Futures Radio Show is your number one source for answers to the questions that all market participants want to ask. Veteran futures trader Anthony Crudelli sits down with the most influential leaders and top traders in the industry. Now, here's your host, Anthony Crudelli. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in for this episode with Eric Townsend. Remember, new shows are posted every Monday and Thursday. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes and YouTube. If you're enjoying the show, please leave us a review on iTunes. Before I play today's interview for you, I want to give a shout out to the great sponsors of Futures Radio Show. CME Group, Trading Technologies, RJO Futures, and Top Step Trader. To learn more about these sponsors and the important things they are doing for futures traders, be sure to click on their logos on our website. Today, I spoke with hedge fund manager and Macro Voices podcast host, Eric Townsend. Eric and I had a great discussion. He explains to us why he became a macro trader and why he chooses to trade crude oil. He explains to us how he developed his trading process from fundamentals to technicals. Eric tells us how he sizes his positions and gives us an example on how he executes a macro trade. Last but not least, we chatted about blockchain and cryptos. Without further ado, let me take you right to the interview with Eric. Eric, thanks for joining me. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Anthony. Well, it's great to have you here today, Eric. I've been really looking forward to this show because... I'm very interested in picking your brain on how you developed your, your process, your strategy, and how you execute your strategy as a macro trader. But I want to start from the beginning. Why did you end up deciding to become a macro trader? Well, what I tell everybody, Anthony, is, and this is not original thinking, it actually is borrowed from Jack Schwager, who wrote the book on the subject, is you've got to find what resonates for your personality. Just doing what was successful for somebody else whose emotional and psychological wiring is different than you are doesn't work. You've got to figure out what resonates for you. And for me, you know, I was always fa fascinated with finance. I was a, a software entrepreneur, and when I sold my software company, I wanted to reinvent myself as a finance guy. And I got talked out of it, unfortunately, by the lawyer that handled the acquisition. And uh, for several years, I, I tried to be retired, and, and that was a, a very negative experience. Eventually, I came back to it. But I had this vision of what investing and trading was. It's very much like a Graham and Dodd style of analyze balance sheets and, and you know look for certain debt to income ratios that were desirable compared to the percentage of your whatever on your balance sheet and really heavy numbers crunching stuff. And I, I knew I was a smart guy and I could do it if I wanted to, but boy, none of that sounded fun at all. And it was when I read Jack Schwager's Market Wizards books, and I read particularly Jim Rogers' chapter in, in the first book, and I just resonated so well with Jim's personality and the way that he approaches markets. And he talks about just understanding the world around you and what makes it tick and what makes geopolitics happen and being able to gain the knowledge to translate an understanding of what is making the world go around into trades that are profitable. And when I found out, like, that's something you can do, that's a style of investing, is to understand geopolitics and, and the state of the world and major trends in the world and translate that to trading ideas. That's a possible thing. Holy cow. And it, it was just captivating for me. And I, I had originally been kind of looking for some kind of, you know, do-gooder thing, something that was... Uh, 
something I could spend my time on that was good for the world. And I got interested in this whole global warming thing. And I very quickly concluded that global warming was uh, – that the science had been tampered with by both sides. I don't know who's right, but I know they're both lying, and they've both been caught lying. And I, I don't want to spend my time trying to sort out who's right when it's all about – politics and so forth. But that interest in global warming led me to learning about peak oil. And I think the original peak oil thesis, at least as it was interpreted in the investment community, was really misplaced because they didn't correctly uh, value technology. They knew that there was going to be this drying up of conventional oil resources. And it's not really a drying up. It's just uh, an inability to increase the rate of production. Uh, they had predictions that were just crazy, and they didn't consider that technology would really come to the rescue. But it was still fascinating to me because energy security is really the future of humanity. If we don't have some kind of nuclear renaissance, we're going to continue to be de dependent on uh, on fossil fuels for energy. And therefore, understanding all about crude oil is something that fascinates me because I'm convinced it's a very, very important thing to understand, to understand what's going to happen to the world in the next 20 years. And that's what really drives my personality is just a, a fantastic curiosity about what the future of the world holds and what the major things are that are going to influence it. And I know that energy security and particularly uh, the availability of crude oil is going to be a huge part of our future. Now, in the beginning, I tried to trade those very long-term macro themes, which is, okay, peak oil as it was perceived in 2007 in the investment community was a lot of hysteria. I knew it was hysteria at the time, but I also knew that the underlying science was real, and eventually we're not going to run out of oil, but we're going to get to the point where the shale plays are played out. We have to go back to deep water offshore, and the incremental cost of, uh, of production is going to go up dramatically. So it's not peak oil, it's peak cheap oil. It's just the, an understanding of the reason why uh, energy over time, I over the next several decades, is going to get much more expensive and it's going to represent a higher percentage of GDP unless there is a global uh, nuclear renaissance, which is a whole other subject we could talk about. So I get very interested about uh, about these subjects that affect the future of the world. And when I tried to trade them directly, like, okay, I think the price of crude oil is going up in the next 20 years. Let me start buying, you know, super long dated calls on crude oil futures. That doesn't make any sense. It, it, it doesn't work because there's no liquidity that far out on the curve and it's not a sensible trade. So what I learned is eventually I still am driven in my interest by these things that are going to affect the world 20 years down the road. But as I learn all about something like crude oil, I start to look at, okay, what's the shape of the term structure, because that's going to be very important over the long term. What are the things I can learn about what's going on and affecting the shape of the term structure? And I got into spread trading on crude oil futures, mostly in the first two years of the, the front end of the curve. But how did I get there? Out of an absolute fascination with what the back end of the curve is going to be showing us 10 or 20 years from now. So it's really about being driven by something you're passionate about. I don't think anybody is ever successful in trading doing something they hate. You've got to get to your screen every morning thirsty and hungry for more information with lots of energy to spend that extra time learning more about it than anybody else knows. And I don't think it's possible to do that unless you're passionate about it. So I start with my passions and I recognize a shortcoming of my passions is that they're intellectual passions are very long-term in nature, and I have to translate those to shorter-term trading strategies. And I use all fundamentals to drive what I do, but how I do it, when I get in and out of the trades, I've learned the value of technicals. So I use technicals to time my entries and exits from trades that are uh, motivated by an understanding of the world and what I uh, expect major trends are going to affect it in coming years. I love your, your passion. I, I really do. I mean, it comes out in your podcast. It comes out with me speaking to you here now. I want to dissect your processing, your strategy a little bit. You mentioned both fundamentals and technicals. Talk to us about 
the development of your process, of your strategy? How did you go about developing it? And then to walk us through uh, the fundamental, and then maybe we'll get into the technical aspect of it as well. Well, again, the, the, in the beginning, the mistake that I made, and, and it's really important to acknowledge that it's a mistake, so I don't encourage anyone else to make it. I think you've got to start with what you're passionate about because that's what drives you. And without passion, w without motivation, you're not going to have edge and you're going to lose. So you've got to have that. And for me, understanding major issues that will affect the future of humanity, it's just... I don't know why I care about the world, you know, as if I owned it, but I do. And I really want to know, forget the nonsense the politicians are spewing. What are the real issues that are going to affect the future of humanity? And energy security is definitely one of the most important ones. So everything from nuclear energy and thorium reactors and the future of things, there's really no investment play in those long-term solutions that I think will eventually come into play because nobody's even recognized how big of a problem we have yet. So you've got to take that long-term view of the world, which for me uh, is just what motivates me and, and what I feel passion for and what drives me and say, okay, I'm going to spend a lot of my time and energy learning all about this and that's great, but I don't want to make the mistake that I made in the beginning of thinking that those 20-year trends are tradable because they're not. So, okay, if I'm going to learn all about crude oil, and the term structure of crude oil. And I really care about the term structure because I want to understand what the market is discounting. And, and, you know, you would think if you look at the science and you realize that crude oil is going to get a lot more expensive in the next 20 years because, it, you know, the shale uh, plays will eventually be played out. We have to go back to deep water. That equipment is more expensive. Eventually it'll get cheaper, but then we'll have to go to Arctic deep water. And, you know, it, it just gets more and more expensive. You would think there would be a steep contango all out the, the futures curve because energy is going to get more expensive in future years. In reality, you tend to have, well, right now we have contango in the, in the curve, which is a, a short-term phenomenon, but most of the time you have backwardation because the factors that drive what the shape of the curve is are not any kind of, of estimate of you know whether or not energy is going to be harder to produce 20 years from now or not. It's all about expectations about shortages of, uh, of supply. And there's this relationship from one month to the next in the spreads that is what the market is pricing those longer term contracts on. It's not really driven by the things that you might intuitively assume it would be driven by. So that got me interested in thinking, oh, well, if the shape of the term structure is not what I would have thought. Well, what is driving it? And so I got really interested in the term structure of crude oil. And I noticed that Brent futures and WTI futures are not the same. You often have contango at the very front of the WTI strip, and you don't have it on the Brent strip. And I thought, well, why is that? That's weird. And I started doing a bunch of research, and I learned that, okay, there's a good reason for that. It has to do with the storage in Cushing, Oklahoma, and basically because there has to be some premium for storing oil, there has to be a little bit of contango at the front of the strip whenever there uh, is plenty of oil in storage in Cushing, because if there wasn't that contango, then the oil would get delivered into the market and it would push the price down. So there has to be a little bit of contango at the front of the curve in WTI, but if you look at the Brent contract, which is based on North Sea oil, and they don't really have that big storage farm, they don't have that little contango hook at the front of the curve. And I started thinking, wait a minute, there's got to be a way to trade that where I can make a profit from knowing that the behavior of the term structure in WTI is a little different from Brent. So I took this, what started with a fascination of what's going to happen to the planet 25 years from now when energy is more scarce. And I tried to trade those things because I'm passionate about them and they're, they're not really tradable and you don't make money that way. And so I said, okay, how do I take these things I'm passionate about and take that energy that I have to learn more about them and really get them down to understanding something that produces a tradable 
uh, strategy. And for me, the answer was really developing a fascination with the term structure of crude oil futures, how they differ from Brent to WTI, how they've changed just in the time that the export of U.S. Uh, crude oil has been uh, legalized, and developing strategies for trading spreads over the first year or so of the uh, WTI structure to benefit from what I've learned about those things. So it's kind of a, you know, the, the process starts with what make what gives me energy to get up in the morning, which is to understand the world around me. And it drives me then to kind of take it down, drill down a level, drill down a level until I get to something tradable. Once I get to something tradable, and I, okay, uh, there's a, there's some kind of oscillation here. There's, uh, I've got this idea that, that there's going to be a trend that, in general, you're more likely to have contango at the front of the WTI curve than you are at the back of the curve, depending on a number of factors. But most of the time, that's true. But the whole thing goes in these waves. Well, how do you time the waves and know where to get in and get out? Well, the answer to that is technical analysis. You've really got to understand uh, technicals in order to recognize when market moves are starting and so forth. So I went from being uh, probably influenced by Jim Rogers, who doesn't believe in technicals at all. I started on that for the same reason Jim says it of, you know, I, I, my brain thinks more about how the world works in the long term, not about what some, you know, chart pattern says to me. But what I learned is, you know, if you don't take those chart patterns seriously, you're going to get run over in the market. So you've got to start by understanding the big picture. And from there, it takes me down to, I care about the technicals to tell me when my big picture predictions are starting to come true and when various things that I've expected to happen are, are either beginning to happen or ending or, you know, stopping from happening or, or what have you. And it's fascinating to me to talk to a trader like yourself, because we were talking a little bit off the air, you know, you're like a technical driven guy. You start there, but you have to go to the macro to understand the big picture so you can kind of make sense of, of what's going on in the world. I come at at this from the opposite end. I've got to start by understanding the world because that's what I'm passionate about. But I know you can't be successful trading it unless you get to the technicals. So it's like there's this overlap, this zone of what I'll call, you know, technical trading competence that is enlightened by a macro uh, awareness of the world around you. You've got to have both, I think, or at least for my style of trading, you got to have both. And, and what I find is most people's personalities are not both. I, I'm the, the big picture fundamentals personality. The technicals I've had to t you know force myself to learn because it's important. A guy like yourself is just a guru at the technicals, but you realize understanding that big picture is important in order for you to be successful. And I think that most of the really successful traders in the world have wound up with an understanding of both. And they were usually driven from one side of it or the other, but they understand they understand both now. And and I think that's where most people probably want to work toward getting to. First, I want to say, talk about a way to pick your product. Uh, I mean, I want everybody out there to, to just think about this for a second. When you just randomly open up a screen, when you want to start begin, when you begin to trade futures and you just pick a product, look at what Eric went through to decide a strategy and a product for himself. Uh, I, I love that story. I can listen to that story over and over again. And going back to using both technicals and fundamentals, I absolutely think in this day and age, you, you, you know, it depends on your time frame, right? I mean, if you're just scalping intraday futures, I don't think that fundamentals really matter that much to you. But if you're someone like me who is a day trader, I like to know what side of the market from my macro homework is going to have that big picture volume behind me. You know, because I don't want to come into a day where there's this macro move going on and my strategy is spitting out everything to go against that trend, <laughs> right? Because if I don't know that that's the reason why we're going down, because a bigger picture move is always going to supersede a shorter term one. So I have been on the wrong side of so many macro moves when they were happening intraday that cost me money. And when you look back at it, you say, hey, man, if I would have done my homework and understand 
why this was happening. I mean, just go back to the recent Fed day when Powell made comments and the market started to go down. You looked at it. I looked at that from doing my macro homework, listening to podcasts like yours, talking to people that understand the bigger picture stuff that those comments that he made were not going to be bullish for s and I'm not stepping in front of this thing getting long. I mean, it's just not going to happen. I don't care what my technicals tell me. At this moment, that bigger picture move supersedes the short term. Well, and I think that right now, Anthony, is such an important time for this because where we, and when I say right now, I don't mean this week or today, I mean this year and over the next several years. Where we are in history right now is a very interesting place. 10 years ago, if you were to tell anybody, look, all of the world's central banks are going to ease for several years straight together in unison, everybody doing it at the same time, and conjure trillions of dollars out of thin air and dramatically increase their balance sheets in order to save the economy. First of all, most people would have said that's impossible. They could never do that. And then there's the whole naysayer crowd who, who, who did say at the time, if they did that, it would blow up for this reason or that reason or the other reason. So we're coming to this moment of, uh, of resolution here. If you believe that Ben Bernanke is an absolute genius who saved the day and did something so many people thought impossible, which is to, to effectively get that free lunch that we always say never exists in finance by printing money. Uh, and it's not technically money printing, but by creating money supply out of thin air where it never existed before in order to buy up all kinds of assets, dramatically, dramatically depress interest rates. If you think that you can get the benefits that have been delivered from that and not suffer any resulting consequence longer term, okay, that's, that's call that, you know, theory A. Theory B is there's no free lunch. There's going to be a price to be paid for all of this central bank largesse, and the big unwind is about to start now, that we're right at this point where all the central banks are saying that they're done with easing and uh, and you know creating money supply to buy assets and so forth. They're winding all of that down. Now, I predict that they'll change their tune when markets tell them to. And we're already starting to see that with this market-driven uh, stuff from Powell in, in the last few weeks. But uh, we're at a point where it's going to be kind of come to Jesus time on this whole central bank policy of the last decade. Can you really pull this off with no adverse consequence? Or does the law of unintended consequences kick in and we end up with a worse than 2008 crisis? I'm not going to take sides on that. But what I will say decisively is we're at the point in history where we're about to find out. It's We're, we're going to know in the next five years whether or not Bernanke was the genius who pulled this all off with no adverse consequence or if the result is going to be something much worse than 2008. Uh, you get people telling you either side of that story. I don't think any of us know because th there's never been any historical precedent for the environment that we're in right now. So if ever there was a time to want to understand the macro around you, if you're a technicals-driven trader, this is that time. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I want to get into technicals here, but before that, I just want to ask you, do you think by you being a businessman before you became a trader really help, is helping you? It, it, I think it is a big help. At the same time, it's probably, I think there, it's a double-edged sword. One of the things that I notice that, that, you know, CEOs always just tell jokes with one another about Wall Street guys, you know, the, the Wall Street analyst who's like, looking at the balance sheet, like, what is this CEO's problem? Why doesn't he understand he needs to increase his revenue in order to get his ratios to where we want to see them? Well, the answer is that in order to increase your revenue, there are these people called customers that play a role in that, and they have to consent to buying stuff in order to increase your revenue. You don't just turn a switch. And it seems like a lot of Wall Street guys who've never run a business don't really understand what's involved in running a business. I guess there's no reason that they should. Um, but they're still experts on business because that's what they do is invest in businesses. So I do think that it helps. But at the same time, what drives markets is the way Wall Street thinks about markets. And if you're too grounded in 
the actual reality, you know, you, the, the very things that we used to, that I complained about as a CEO, Wall Street looks at quarter over quarter earnings growth. They don't care whether or not management is doing the right thing for the shareholders over the next 20 years. And even if management is doing something that is setting up a failure where the company is almost certain to implode and go bankrupt 10 years from now, but it produces really great quarter over quarter growth right now, Wall Street does not care about the long-term picture. They only care about that quarter over quarter earnings growth. That's what makes them tick. If you start to think, you know, if you try to be smarter than the market and say, hey, I'm a real businessman. I know better than that. You know, I'm going to invest in this company over here that's really doing a good job of thinking about the long-term future. Well, guess what? All the other investors are, are not caring that that company is doing it right. They, they're going by the quarter over quarter earnings growth. That's what's going to drive the share price. And I actually don't invest in tech stocks, even though that's my background and what you would think I would be best qualified in, because I, I was so frustrated with that divide between Wall Street and tech. You know, we, we care when you're running the tech company, you care about inventing the, the better mousetrap that's going to change the future of the industry, that's going to give you that Microsoft, Apple-like, you know, Google-like prominence in the industry. You, you care about that. You don't care about next quarter's revenue growth. Until you bring in professional management after you take your company public, then you have to care about quarter over quarter uh, revenue growth because that's what Wall Street is driven by. Um, you know, if you're going to play in this Wall Street game, you got to play by their rules. And they think like Wall Street guys, not like entrepreneurs. What technical analysis do you use? I use uh, a number of charting strategies, moving averages. Um, I, I really believe in the second derivative uh, of growth, the, the slope of change. So I, I don't really care that much about, you know, what uh, what this week's number is. I care more about the rate at which it's changing, the rate that things are getting better or the rate at which they're getting worse, uh, how, how quickly change is occurring. And that uh, relates to everything from security prices to revenue growth to uh, a number of things. In general, I'm not really a, uh, a stock investor. And one of the reasons for that is I feel that it's an oversaturated market. In order to really be good at, uh, at stock investing and to have an edge over other traders, you've got to be really, really, really good because stock trading is the most popular game in existence. Uh, futures trading is much more interesting to me because it's much more closely related to what I care about, which is understanding the world. So crude oil futures, and particularly the term structure, the forward strip in crude oil futures, which is being driven by what Wall Street thinks is important, interest rates and, and so forth. I think what's really going to drive the shape of the forward strip in the long run is the cost of oil production uh, 10 or 20 years from now, once the shale plays have played out and we're back to uh, extremely deep water offshore in order to make up for the continued uh, decay of production from the conventional oil field resources. So I look at those mispricings that occur in the long term, and I've learned not to trade those very long term things. But uh, I, 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 I look at where the opportunity uh, to, to arbitrage the, those discrepancies from my long-term view versus the way markets are pricing things. And I use technicals uh, in terms of just, you know, historical norms. How, how far into backwardation can the market get when I know that the real long-term fundamentals say that it really should be in contango if you consider what I think is going to happen to the world in the next 20 years. Um, I, some of the, the uh, you know, the, the specific body parts chart patterns, I call them head and shoulders and, and you know, uh, cup and saucer patterns and so forth. I, I know what they all are, but I would not consider myself a huge expert on those. My my technicals are basically uh, moving averages, uh, 
previous levels that have held previous lows, previous highs, and uh, a little bit of measured moves, but nothing super fancy. Most of what I do is driven by fundamentals, and I'm using the technicals just to time the entries. I want to talk about the execution side of things coming from you as a macro trader. Can you share with us a recent example of a crude oil trade that you studied on the macro side, then you, uh, what you saw on the technical side, and then walk us through how you get into the trade, but also how you determine a stop, where you would be wrong on the trade? Because I'm always interested to see how someone who has a macro point of view uh, decides when they're wrong, right? Because the, the market, they may be right on the macro side of things, but the market might be proving them wrong. So I want to know how you would be proved wrong. And then also how you would determine uh, your targets, uh, your, where you think the market could go. Yeah, sizing macro trades is a, a fascinating topic. Kyle Bass talks about that quite a bit. And the way that I do it is I always start with, uh, we can all be wrong. How much am I willing to lose in either dollars or basis points, you know, percent of portfolio, however you want to express it. How much am I willing to lose when I end up being proven wrong? And I really try to get my head around when that happens, not if that happens. And it's just in terms of, of managing risk. You, you don't ever want to get yourself into the, oh, but I know it's never going to happen. It's the, you know, it's it, because I'm sure I'm right. You, you can't think that way because you get killed. You can always be wrong. So when I'm proven wrong, what's the, the number that I can be satisfied with and say, hey, I had so much conviction about that trade. I don't mind losing X number of dollars or X percent of my portfolio for having been proven wrong. And then once I've got that number, I write that down, I set it aside, I don't do the math to figure out you know, what the stop level has to be, but I look at the chart and I say, what's the price that this thing has to hit on the chart where it, it, it doesn't add up anymore? If it gets to this level on the chart, that means I'm wrong. And once I know those two numbers, I know where the stop is, which is where I'm wrong, not, not where I've run out of money to, to lose, but where I'm wrong on the chart. And I know how much money I need, uh, I'm willing to lose, and I divide them, and I end up with the position size. That, that's the way that I, I size uh, positions. And what that means is you end up sometimes with uh, fairly small positions uh, – you know, be, because it really feels like, look, if, if I've nailed this right on the technicals, you know, we're not going to go to new all time highs on the stock market. If we get to, uh, you know, uh, 2950 again and I short that, well, uh, I can use pretty big size there because I know as soon as we get to new all time highs that I was wrong and that's my stop. And uh, OK, whereas if I'm dealing with something like spreads on crude oil futures where little disruptions can really put big wrinkles in them. You, if you uh, are trading spreads in crude oil futures and you have something like uh, last, uh, I think it was last year in, in around Thanksgiving, we had a minor spill in the Keystone pipeline. It was only about 5,000 barrels that spilled. But for about a day or so, the news was very uncertain. It wasn't really clear. It was some kind of spill and they were trying to get good data on how big it was, and nobody was sure. And, of course, markets hate any kind of uncertainty. You know, it, it could be anything. We don't know how big the spill is. Oh, my God. And there was an absolute panic blowout in uh, crude oil spreads around those delivery months uh, uh, that I happened to be actively trading. And, you know, I got stopped out of that, that uh, position. It, it turned out to be nothing. It was it was just a 5,000 barrel spill, and all of the dislocation that occurred in the spreads ended up coming back out. But it was still enough to trip me out of a position. And so you've got when when you trade based on macro themes that are big picture stuff, you've got to realize that little picture stuff can screw up your trade. This was a a, a trade that was motivated by an understanding of how the front end of the WTI strip, the spreads are affected by different fundamentals than what affects them two years out. At the front of the strip, it's really about how much inventory 
is physically in the tank in Cushing, Oklahoma. When you're looking a year or two out, then the shape of the term structure is entirely about future expectations of tightening or easing of, uh, of supply demand uh, dynamics between markets. So there's a transition point about four to six months uh, out on the strip where the factors that are affecting those spreads changes and you can often get a reversal in the pattern of the term structure. If, if you're betting on that big picture playing out over the course of a year where you, you start out by shorting spreads that are a year out on the curve, figuring that you're going to short them in backwardation and you're going to end up covering those shorts in contango at the, the front of the strip. And then all of a sudden there's a pipeline spill that can create massive backwardation, which if you understand it, it's a fantastic opportunity to double your size if you really understand it. But if you don't understand what's going on, you, you know, you, you're, you're going to get stopped out there because all of the sudden this spread you thought should get smaller is getting bigger, dramatically bigger. Well, why is it getting bigger? It's getting bigger because the pipeline sprung a leak. How big is the leak? How long is it going to take them to fix it? And one of the problems that it, it results in, especially for independent traders, is you don't have as good of information as the really big trading desks. The, the guys at VTOL that that are you know, trading crude oil, have every imaginable information source under the sun. They can afford to, to pay for all of it. And if you're um, you know, following hashtag OOTT on Twitter, and maybe you, you've got uh, a subscription service to one of the entry-level uh, you know, crude oil data services, but you don't have all the expensive stuff, you're really at a disadvantage, and you, you've got to think about what kind of trades you want to put on. So um, it, it really, I think it starts, from, uh, it starts from understanding what you expect to have happen, but then you've got to figure out what are the things that can go wrong. And there are things outside of your control. Are, are you going to use that opportunity and just accept the stomp out? Do, do you want to go for maybe a tighter stop and use that opportunity when you get stopped out to look to reenter at a much wider spread? Uh, you can do that. You know, certainly there have been times in my experience where I've done that. I've been stopped out because the spreads were blowing up. I thought they were going to get smaller. Why are they blowing up? Because we had wildfires in Canada and the shutdown of the uh, 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 of the Keystone Pipeline for maintenance and so forth. And I looked at the whole situation. And I said, you know, this is horrible, but it's it's going to get better. And these spreads now are at way beyond historical norms. They're still four or five months from expiry. I'm going to short them now that they've blown out. And sure enough, that was a profitable trade. I ended up more than double making back what I lost when I got stopped out of the trade in the other direction. So really understanding what's driving this stuff is important. And I think that uh, you know it's, it's something that there's a, a different discipline that I don't subscribe to just because it doesn't suit my personality. A lot of traders would say, don't try to understand any of that. Just look at the chart. You know, when you see uh, something start to trend in the opposite direction than you expect, get out. Don't try to understand it. Well, if you don't try to understand it, um, that's, that's fine, but you don't know why you're getting out. I, I need to understand it. I would go crazy just getting stopped out of trades, having no idea what went wrong. I need to understand what the driver is. Okay, the reason that I just got stopped out of my spread trade is because there was a, a spill on the Keystone Pipeline. So what's going on? How, how long is it going to take to fix it? How, what do I expect the market to do after this problem has been resolved? Uh, to me, I, I don't know. I, I guess it's just a personality thing. I, I couldn't do trading without caring about and trying to analyze my trades that went wrong and figure out what caused them to go wrong. Uh, I guess a lot of other guys just, you know, once you hit the stop, you forget about it, you move on to the next trade. Uh, I don't do that because I can't. I'm not emotionally capable of that. And I'd say the most important single lesson that I've learned about trading is to recognize that all of us are emotionally incapable of something. 
Figure out what it is that you personally are emotionally incapable of. Stop denying that you're in incapable of it and make adjustments accordingly. And I know in my case, I have to understand how things work. I, I, it's just how my personality is wired. And that limits me. I can't engage in certain trading strategies that work for other people because they don't care. They don't need to know how things work and why things work. I, I have to know that. It's just how my personality is wired. So what I'm gathering from this, and I'm learning a lot from listening to you talk about how a macro trader executes, and it sounds like you go through your fundamentals, you develop your macro theme, and then you start to look at the charts to see if it's supporting or contradicting what you think should be happening, and then you are getting into the market based upon that fundamental theme, and then you have a price amount of risk that you might get out because of some short-term thing that happens, but you'll continue to trade that theme as long as the fundamentals still support it, but you'll use the technicals as a gauge to see how much it's being supported or not. Am I right on this? Yeah, and let's, let's translate that to a really good current day example, which is if you look at what's going on with, uh, with treasury yields, there have been a lot of macro reasons to say, okay, we, we really artificially depressed treasury yields with quantitative easing. We're, we're now moving to quantitative tightening. It stands to reason that the secular bond bull market is ending and it's time to start a bond bear market and that spreads are going to move higher. And that's what was happening for a while. What we've seen in the last uh, six weeks or so is there's been a reversal and you've got to look at that and you've got to take the technicals seriously and say wait a minute we blew through some key levels without even you know there, there was a breakout above three spot 10 three spot 12 or so on the 10-year yield that so many technicians were sure was going to hold and that we were headed secularly toward uh, higher bond yields lower bond prices all of a sudden that reversed and it reversed with vengeance and that's a technical signal where you say, okay, maybe my macro view that the bond bull market is over is still right. I think it is still right. But it looks like maybe we're headed into a recession in late 2019, 2020. And that is going to drive bond yields sharply lower for what's going to be the buying opportunity. And of course, if you're talking about a lower yield and you want to profit from the yield going back up again, uh, you want to be shorting the, uh, the the actual bonds because the the price and the yield are, are inversely correlated. So if we're going to go down in yields and get back down below sub two percent, and I had a really solid set of reasons for thinking that we're going the other way, well then that means that we're in a really powerful counter trend rally. We're going to be in a cyclical uh, bull market in treasury bonds for a little while that maybe will take us into a recession period. But the depths of that reception of that recession are going to be the short selling opportunity of a lifetime in treasuries. OK, I can start to lay out those dominoes. So right now, clearly the, the treasury trade, you want to be long if you're in treasuries because the trend has reversed very sharply to the upside in price, downside in yield. Why? How could that be happening given the macro backdrop where so many people thought we were headed toward higher yields? Uh, because probably we're getting a, a really strong recession signal. And that would perfectly explain it. Okay, well, what that means is any recession signal, normally, you know, the bottom of the recession is a good time to be selling your bonds when the yields bottom. This ought to be a time when maybe, I don't know if we get back to that one spot 34 on the 10-year yield, which was the previous low, and, and uh, double top on price there. But even if we don't, whatever we get to at the depths of this coming recession, if this is a recession uh, signal, which is the way I'm interpreting it, um, that's going to be a shorting opportunity of a lifetime. It, it's probably six to 12 months away. I, I could be totally wrong. My thinking could uh, be totally changed by the time it's time to trade that. But I'm already starting to put the macro picture together in my head and think, hmm, next time we get to what feels like yields are bottoming 
it could be not just a trend, but a secular trend opportunity to get short treasury bonds at that point. And But then I, I step back and I think about the bigger picture. I think, wait a minute, short treasury bonds, the treasury bonds, if, if we get into a lot of trouble in the economy, are still going to be the safe haven. But look at junk bonds and look at the triple Bs particularly. Okay, so if I want to say that... Uh, Rates are coming down now. There's going to be a fixed income short opportunity in the depths of this recession that we think might be coming. That's still a year out maybe before you'd be putting on that short trade. It, probably it's in the junk or the triple B rated, not the treasuries. Well, let me start doing my homework. And that's a lot of what I'm doing now is I, I know about uh, junk bonds. What I don't know a whole lot about, and, and I mean, I know the concepts of it, but if you say, well, opportunity is to short the triple B rated because when that stuff gets downgraded to junk, institutions will be forced to sell it. Well, that sounds good in a podcast interview. A lot of guys have said that in podcast interviews. Have they actually gone and looked at what instruments you can use to short triple B rated corporate fixed income? And the answer is there's not a lot of direct plays. If there's anybody that works for iShares listening to this, you guys should be creating a triple B short ETF because we need one. Uh, but that doesn't exist. Are you going to short the individual issues? You really need to be bigger institutional size than I am to short individual bond issues in the triple B space. So what's the ETF or other vehicle that you're going to short triple B rated credit through? And what's the possibility that regulators are going to panic and know that a triple B collapse could cause a domino effect in the global economy and causes them to bail it out? So, you know, you don't want to be too smart. Maybe the junk is a better place or maybe it's a combination of the junk rated and the triple Bs that you want to get short. The thing is, right now we're uptrending in, in price, downtrending in yield. It's not time to be shorting anything, but I'm already starting to think about what the factors are that are going to be the best uh, selection of what my fixed income short is going to be, because I'm convinced in the next year we're going to have an opportunity to short fixed income that's going to be really profitable. It's not the thing to do right now. You want to be on the other side of the trade right now on a, a shorter term basis, but the long term opportunity is going to be short fixed income, probably not treasuries, probably triple B is better than junk. It's really hard to identify what instrument to do that with. So I'm, and, and you don't want to be shorting long, uh, you don't want a, a triple B heavy ETF, which a lot of people have looked at this and said, I want to short something that's triple B. What, who's got all the triple Bs? Well, there's a few ETFs that are not, they're, they're just advertised as institutional fixed income uh, uh, you know, ETFs. They're really heavy in triple B exposure. But the thing is, you know those are going to be impossible. You're not going to be able to get a borrow on those when this thing hits, if it hits in the way that I think. Nobody has a, a short instrument where you can buy it long in order to express that trade. So how are, how are you going to short triple Bs when you can't get a borrow on the long triple B ETFs? Um, that's a, a question that I'm trying to figure out right now, knowing that it's the wrong time to put the trade on, but because I'm convinced it's going to be the right time to put that trade on sometime in the next year. And I tend to be a, you know, make my plans 10 steps ahead of the market and I end up throwing away half of my plans because the market didn't do what I expected and the plan that I made ended up not being relevant. So maybe we get to a year from now, there was no recession. There, there's no reason to be shorting triple B uh, corporates at that point. But if there is one, damn it, between now and then, I'm going to figure out exactly how to do it and I'm going to be ready for it. And I guess that's what drives a lot of what I do. And, I, and most of the traders I talk to, they kind of shake their heads and I'm like, dude, you know, it, wouldn't it be so much easier just to, to learn to trade technicals, be a day trader and, and stuff? The answer is I would go crazy if, if I – even if I was making all kinds of money, you know, day trading technicals, a lot of people actually trade symbols without knowing what the company is because they don't want it to bias their thinking. I could never do that. It would drive me crazy. Uh, so it's, it's about what works for your personality. I mean, such a great example of having to understand macro themes uh, alongside with technical analysis when it comes to uh, the treasury and bond market. And and I could really talk to you all day about this because this is one of my favorite subjects, but I'm going to have to have you back on because I want to move on and I, I want to talk to you about stats. 
And the question I have is, is that as a technical trader, we can look at past setups that look similar to a setup that we're seeing right now. So if we're building our strategy, we can go back and we could pull some stats and say, hey, look, at this is a look that we were looking at. And we could actually see how often it, it, that setup works, right? But as a macro trader, things are always changing. And I, I do see a lot of the macro traders I follow go back and do comparisons. But let's face it, it it's never... It, it, you can't compare it the way that we can compare like a chart pattern or something that happens with a, a technical indicator. So I'm wondering, do you do any stats on your strategy to see if some looks that you're looking at work better, better than others? Like how, how do you know when maybe you should be trading bigger or smaller? Yeah, you know, that's a really excellent question. And I'm not sure I have a, a perfect answer for it because in the world of macro, it's so subjective and it's so easy to lie to yourself. You know, one of the things I always laugh at is that people will tell me, well, in every post-war recession, well, okay, first of all, you're just, you're prefixing your whole statement with every post-war recession. So you're assuming that, you know, pre-World War II doesn't matter. And if you look at the long-term Kondratiev cycle, it's very clear that we're at the end of a fourth turning. There's a lot of reason to care about not what's happened since World War II, but what happened at the end of the last uh, uh, fourth turning and, and the Great Depression and so forth. So it's so a lot of reasons to just discount it there. But then what they'll go to is in every single post-war uh, recession, you know, any time that the Treasury yield curve has inverted, it means this, this, and this. And I just think, wait a minute, there's never, ever been a time in history when central banks were completely owning at least the long end of the curve and to some extent the short end of the curve. Uh, we've never had a time in history when the factors that control interest rates were as manipulated, if you want to use that word, or managed by government, if, if you feel better with, with that terminology. Uh, we didn't have the government trying to control interest rates anything close to the way we do now. So how can you even make these historical comparisons to what happened in the past when the bond, you know, treasury yield curve inverted? How is that relevant when you're comparing it to periods where the Fed didn't own the curve the way it does today? Um, so I think it's very easy to, uh, to make stories up. The other thing that I uh, you know, I, I'm convinced you can always do one of those comparison charts where like, look at the period today, Anthony, and the period leading up to the period just before the period that led us into the Great Depression. And look, I've, I've taken this small segment of the S&P chart and I've overlaid it with the other one and it's a perfect match. Can you believe it? It's, it's well, wait a minute. Do, 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 is there even any historical precedent to say that when you have an overlay of a near perfect match in the shape of the the some small amount of history on the S and P chart and the current progress on the S and P chart, that that is predictive and really going to tell you anything. Um, so I think a lot of people end up engineering their own comfort. Uh, they they, they want to feel comfortable that they're doing the right thing, so they look for historical comparisons that they can use to justify the actions they were going to take anyway. And I, I try to be, uh, I've fallen into that trap myself, and I just try to be cognizant of it because I think it's really easy to get into. Uh, I definitely think that in macro analysis, understanding how periods compare to previous periods in history is super important. But you've got to ask yourself, am I comparing now to 1938, which is what I think for a number of reasons, I think that's exactly where we are economically is 1938. Um, am I really making that because that that uh, comparison because I think there are strong corollaries in the economic conditions and the debt cycle to what existed then? Or am I just trying to justify some trade I've put on by saying, look, look, it's it's just like this period. And and, and if I'm right, then this is what's going to play out. It, it's very easy, you know, with, with the technical driven stuff, the, the way technical traders work, especially shorter term technicals, you know, you really are going by, look, I, I've got a setup here. It's, it's like it, 
the, for the last umpteen zillion years, anytime you had five consecutive down days on the S and P, and I'm making this up, I don't know the real the real number, but you know, X number of down days. Surely, even if it's a new trend down, there's going to be a bounce. The you, you know, you want to be a, as a day trader, you want to be long on the sixth day or the seventh day, whatever the the number is. Um, those things have a lot. Uh, those are a lot more defensible in my mind. When you start saying now is like 1938, which is is something that I believe, boy, I mean, in a lot of ways, it, it is. Uh, if you look at the debt cycle, Ray Dalio agrees with me. But I mean, look at the Internet. Look at, at technology that we have today. It's nothing like 1938. So, you know, is is my economic comparison valid or not? I think it's easier to lie to yourself in macro than it is in short term technical analysis. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but, but that was kind of what came to mind. No, it does. And it explains to me also why you use technical analysis in your strategy, because it, you know, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but it, it gives you a little bit of a guide. It, it, it confirms or contradicts what you're thinking. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, the fundamental analysis tells you what trade should be working. Technical analysis tells you whether or not it is working. Exactly. Uh, you know, yeah. and you want both because something yeah. that is working but shouldn't be, that's maybe a setup to, to for it to reverse on you. Something that should be working and is working, that that's that's a good deal to bet on. Yeah, it's going to be a bigger move, um, most likely. <laughs> um, all right, I, I want to move on and talk about your book, Beyond Blockchain. Thank you for the copy, uh, by the way. So far, it's really, really good. I haven't finished it yet. I'm in the middle of it right now. And what I really am loving about it is that you're not jamming blockchain down everyone's throat like a lot of crypto people are. You explain the reasons blockchain and crypto were created. You talk about the culture, which I really liked that you, that you put that in there at the beginning. And you talk about why you believe it will have a big impact on financial markets in the world. And listen, I, I agree with you so far what I'm reading in the book that, I, that blockchain is going to have a massive impact on financial markets and, and the world for that matter. But many people don't still. And, and I really do think a lot of it is because people don't understand it. And you also have people talking about it in the wrong tone. And I've talked about this with you in, in, in a prior conversation. I believe tone matters. And in your book, you do an excellent job of laying things out. You set a good tone. You go in there with real reasons why you believe blockchain is going to have an impact. So I want everyone to get your book. So I don't want you to, to share too much, but tell us why you decided to write it and what people will learn in this book. Sure. Well, the reason that I decided to write the book is I realized that I had made a really huge mistake and I recognized that almost everybody else is making that same mistake. And the mistake that I made is I lumped digital currency and cryptocurrency together as one thing and I evaluated it as one thing. The conclusion that I initially came to as most of the smarter people in the finance community have come to, is look, this uh, cryptocurrency idea, as much as it might have some cool technology behind it, and I'm a, I'm a technology guy. I ran a software company. I was a, a technologist and entrepreneur in my first career. So uh, I, I relate to technology, but it doesn't matter how cool the technology is. What these guys are doing is coining their own money and assuming that government is going to allow them to continue to do so. And they're telling themselves a lie, which is that it's imper you know, government is powerless to stop it. It's impervious to government oversight. Bitcoin was designed so that you know, the government can't shut it down. That's nonsense. All they have to do is outlaw it, and that will cause most people, just for the sake of complying with the law, to stop using it, even if it's possible to use it. And if they want to go a step further than that, if they outlaw and prohibit the conversion of fiat currency into cryptocurrency tokens or opposite direction, you know, cryptocurrency into fiat, they can very easily regulate that and shut that down. And at that point, you've effectively eliminated cryptocurrency in the way that, that people are using it today. So governments are not powerless. And the notion that 
these guys are going to invent their own money, basically thumb their noses, which is what and, and I happen to agree with them, by the way. If you if you look at the essence of the crypto message, it's basically the hell with central bankers. We're going to create our own money system and we're going to take the power away from the government and give it back to the people where it belongs. Uh, as a libertarian, I love the message. It feels good to me. But I, I live in the real world, Anthony. I know that central bankers and governments have all the power. They've got the guns. They've got the badges. They've got the ammunition. They've got the law uh, on their side, and they get to rewrite the law anytime they want to. So I knew that cryptocurrency was not going to take over the world as uh, – is the Bitcoin crowd would like to think. And I was dismissive of it. And I joked about it as so many people in finance have done. And what I eventually realized is, wait a minute, I'm missing the whole story here. You've got to separate the invention of digital cash, which is really a profound idea. And particularly the underlying technology, which is called distributed ledger. That's the, the blockchain part of blockchain and Bitcoin. It's a really brilliant invention. It's a breakthrough in computer science that can change the way a lot of things work. But the thing is, the guys who invented it decided to use it to go and coin their own money and thumb their noses at the government. I predict that that's going to come to a very uh, abrupt end when governments shut it down, which they do have the power to do. It's, it's nonsense to say governments are powerless to stop it. But that doesn't mean that governments aren't going to say, hey, wait a minute, who stands the most to gain from this digital currency technology? Government itself stands more to gain than anybody else because just as you can, you know, Bitcoin was designed to do a very specific thing, which is to take power away from government and to protect the, the financial privacy of private citizens by making it impossible for government to trace and monitor and control their financial affairs. Well, first of all, a lot of it can actually be traced and monitored, but uh, you could go the other direction and you could design a government-issued digital currency that is designed from the ground up for achieving the exact opposite goal of what Bitcoin was designed to do, to give government more power to oversee and monitor and control everybody's financial transactions so that governments know for every penny of wealth that exists on the planet who's got it, where they got it from, when they got it, under what conditions they got it. Uh, it there's an audit trail that the government can, can look at going back, you know, from the inception of a new digital currency system to give them all the information and control they want. Now, that's the antithesis of what Bitcoin was designed to be. But I think governments are going to wake up, and, and they, they, they already have. It was purely by coincidence. The very day that my book was released, Christine Lagarde, the head of the IMF, announced, hey, central bankers should be looking at digital currency in terms of designing their own digital currency systems to be state-backed digital currencies. And that's exactly what my book predicts, is that governments are going to say, wait, we love this invention, but we're not going to let libertarian privacy activists have you know, all of the power and control and take it away from government. We're going to steal their invention from them. We're going to use distributed ledger and uh, double spend proof digital cash inventions to create government issued digital currency, which gives government more power, not less power to uh, do all of the things that Satoshi Nakamoto didn't want them to be able to do. And that's a, a sad story for libertarians, but I think that's what's coming. The thing that we're really on the cusp of, though, Anthony, and I don't want to get too technical on you, is a lot of people predicted in the beginning, they said, okay, this blockchain thing is really the interesting part. It's not so much the Bitcoin currency, it's the blockchain distributed ledger. And what they found is that prediction really didn't pan out. Ten years later, there are not that many applications for blockchain. Well, what went wrong? What went wrong is the design of blockchain almost has to have a currency associated with it because it has this concept of mining. The only thing that keeps the blockchain safe is these miners that have to uh, validate and secure all of the transactions being added to it. As long as you have mining, you've got to incentivize the miners to want to do this mining. And you do that by giving them uh, newly created cryptocurrency tokens. That's the way Bitcoin works. To have blockchain without Bitcoin, there's no incentive for anybody to mine 
the uh, the the blockchain and 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 it doesn't work as well. What we need to get to is the same technology that exists, and there's a chapter about this in the book called Permission Distributed Ledgers. We need to have a fully decentralized distributed ledger that doesn't have mining, that allows any application to benefit from this idea of an ownerless distributed database and not need to have an associated cryptocurrency. Really, with blockchain, you got to have a cryptocurrency associated with it because that's the only way to incentivize the miners. If you get rid of the miners, you don't have to do that. Now, somebody claims just in the last few weeks to have broken the, it's called the proof of work barrier, the the technology that makes blockchain work. They've come up with a better mousetrap, supposedly. Um, I would guess, just knowing marketing, that if they say that it, they've got it all working and it's all fabulous, that means they think they're about to get it working and it's not quite there yet. So I don't know whether we've actually broken the proof of work barrier yet, but we're about to. And we're probably going to see a new generation of financial software innovation when we get to the idea of a uh, permissionless distributed ledger system, which does not require mining. So I'm sorry to be so technical. If you read the book, it'll explain what all those things mean. Uh, but we're about to hit a really major breakthrough point. And I think that digital currency is going to change the world. The part that the Bitcoin people are going to be really upset about is Bitcoin probably won't play a very meaningful uh, role in that story in the history books. And what I liken it to in the book is the Wright Flyer. Everybody agrees the Wright Flyer, the world's first airplane, is a huge, important piece of technology history. It will never, ever be forgotten, just as Bitcoin will never, ever be forgotten. But guess what? They didn't make any more Wright Flyers, and you don't see them at the airport today. We've got Airbuses and Boeings to fly around in. Uh, Bitcoin is going to find its way into a museum where it belongs next to the Wright Flyer. And it's a, a, a brilliant innovation, but it's not going to be at the center of the digital currency revolution. As much as the coiners don't want to hear it, I think that government-issued digital currency is most likely to be at the center of the digital currency revolution. And it's going to be potentially a much more Orwellian experience than a lot of people are bargaining on. So it may not be a good thing in some ways, but a really big change is coming. You've got to pay attention to digital currency and don't let cryptocurrency and your skepticism about cryptocurrency dissuade you from paying attention to digital currency. You got to think of them as separate topics. That's a really long-winded answer to a simple question, so I apologize for that. But that's what the book's about. Everybody, go get Eric's book. Read it. It's great. Uh, Eric, we've got some rapid-fire questions next if you're ready for those. Hit me up. All right, everybody, our rapid fire segment is sponsored by Trading Technologies. Access the global markets from virtually anywhere with TT. They are the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. And now you can trade cryptocurrency spot and derivative markets side by side. For more information, please visit tradingtechnologies.com. Eric, first question, what trader has influenced your life the most and why? Jim Rogers, as I explained earlier, was the guy uh, through his interview in Jack Schwager's Market Wizards book who opened my eyes to realizing that my fascination about what makes the world work can be translated to profitable trading strategy. Uh, before that, I thought it was all about Graham and Dodd balance sheet analysis, and that just wouldn't have been exciting for me. What was one of the hardest things for you to overcome in trading? Uh, excessive loyalty to my beliefs uh, and you know you can be right about something and the market is moving against you and the right thing to do is to get out of the way in the beginning I was stubborn and I knew I was right and I was going to ride my position damn it till the end well <laughs> you can blow up an account and lose all your money that way in really short order even shorter order with uh, futures trading so knowing what that you're right in the long term you've got to temper that and figure out whether or not the market's cooperating with you here and now. That's probably the biggest lesson that I've had to learn. How has your trading process evolved over the years? Uh, it started from trying to trade the long-term trends that I feel the most passionate interest about, such as crude oil prices are going to go higher in the long run. Well, obviously, in the last few years, they've gone dramatically lower, and there were I made plenty of money, by the way, shorting it because I had learned my lesson by then. In the beginning, 
I would have tried to just, you know, double down on my long positions as 2014 was happening, saying, you know, this is this is great because I know in the end the prices are going higher. I still think prices are going higher, but you, you want to make money in the down markets by being short, not by uh, being excessively committed to a longer term strategy. So it really is uh, adjusting my process around the time frame of what's tradable in the market versus the time frame of my long-term predictions. What is one attribute that you believe every trader should have? Discipline uh, and, and willingness to, uh, to be proven wrong. Nobody is ever right all of the time. And every, every minute little iota of emotion that you spend weeping over the money you lost being wrong is wasted. You've got to develop the discipline to know that you're going to be right some of the time and wrong some of the time. You learn from your mistakes and you move on. And you use appropriate risk controls so that when you're wrong, you get stopped out of the trade and uh, you, you don't get into uh, a panic of trying to make decisions in the market. You, the conditions for getting out of the trade should always be decided before the trade is put on in the first place. Favorite book about trading? Market Wizards series, all of them by Jack Schwager. And I think it's, even if you've read them all, the, you, you can't read them too many times. Uh, every time that I'm on an airplane, I have all of the Market Wizards books in my Kindle. And any time that I'm on a long airline flight, I would just reread Market Wizards because there's always something to gain. And it's not necessarily learning trading techniques. It's learning about how people process, you know, how the most successful traders process their losses, what they do after a losing streak, uh, how, how they refine their process, how they develop their process. It's, it's just fantastic stuff. Favorite movie about trading? The best screenplay ever written in all history about trading is Payback, starring Matt Damon as yours truly. Unfortunately, my director friend has not shopped that to, uh, he, he is shopping that screenplay, and uh, Matt Damon doesn't know about it yet. Matt, if you're listening, we've got a, a script for you to read, sir. Um, but until that one gets made, uh, that, that, that basically is trading places rewritten by somebody who actually knows how futures markets work and it's a great movie. But, uh, until we get that one made, I, I guess I have to go back to trading places is, as much as there's a lot wrong with it. And as much as it leaves room for improvement, uh, I think it's the best trading movie that I'm aware of. What's the best piece of advice that you've received about trading? Boy, um, loyalty to people is good. Loyalty to positions is bad. Uh, I don't know that that's, that's the, the best soundbite, but that's the best concept. You, you've got to understand that sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong, and sometimes you're right, but the market is wrong. And if, if the market is wrong, it's probably going to continue being wrong. And it's not time for you to have your day in the sun yet. You, you've just got to get let go of stubbornness and accept that when you're right about something, sometimes the market's going to help you make a profit from it. And other times it's just not time and, and you got to accept it for what it is. If you could go back in time and give the younger you a piece of advice, what would it be? <sighs> back off on conviction you're going to be right in the long term, but you've got to allow for the market to be wrong in the intermediate term and don't fight the trend. If you had an elevator pitch, your edge in trading, what would it be? Understanding, uh, well, my, my real, it depends because I think you, you need to be very, very focused. What I would have said a few years ago is that I understand anomalies in the term structure of WTI crude futures and how they differ from Brent crude futures well enough to develop extremely repeatable spread systematic trade spread trading strategies that really work consistently. Uh, guess what? When they, they, uh, legalized export of crude, the dynamics changed. And that particular piece of edge that I had 
uh, isn't really there anymore. And so if you think about specific knowledge of exact trading strategies, sometimes uh, they get stale and, and changes in the marketplace change them. So my very best one, uh, I lost with the legalization of crude oil exports from the U.S. Uh, in general, though, I would say bigger picture, uh, my ability to understand big systems and complex subjects. Uh, I'm able to think about what crude oil futures are going to do in the next six months in the context of understanding what I think is going to happen in the next 20 years and what I think is going to happen in the next five years, which are all very different stories. Most people that I talk to are not good at thinking in different time frames simultaneously, and I, I guess that's something that I'm pretty good at. Last question for today. Favorite thing to do when you're not trading? Boy, you know, I'm going to translate it because I, I listened to somebody else, I forget who, who, who took that question and changed it to what's the one thing that can get my mind off of trading? Because there's lots of things I do that are fun, and I'm sitting there thinking about crude oil futures while I'm doing them. Scuba diving is one of very, very few things that I can do where I just think about the fish in front of my face, and I'm not thinking about the market or what you know, Powell is going to say at the next meeting or whatever, I'm just thinking about the fish. Um, flying airplanes used to be it for me, but then I, I learned about peak oil and decided that I had burned up my share of, uh, of aviation gasoline. So I don't do that anymore. Uh, where can people find you on Twitter? Give us a website to check out. Also, where people should go and buy the book if it's not on the website or and uh, give us the uh, your podcast as well, Macro Voices. Well, my anchor for all of those things is macrovoices.com, macrovoices.com. Um, that's where the podcast is. You can also sign up for the podcast on uh, iTunes. We haven't done Spotify and all of these other outlets yet. I don't know if you're doing that with your podcast. We're getting requests for it. But we're, we're on iTunes and we're on our own website. Uh, macrovoices.com forward slash BB for Beyond Blockchain is the landing page for the book. You can buy the audio book or the uh, Kindle or uh, paperback version. Uh, there's an Amazon link for Kindle and paperback. The audio book is a separate provider. Uh, so that's all there at macrovoices.com. And my Twitter handle is Eric, E-R-I-K-S, like Sam Townsend, T-O-W-N-S-E-N-D. Uh, and you can also follow at Macro Voices for information about the podcast. Eric, I had a blast today. I, I can't thank you enough for sharing um, such great insight with us. Uh, like I said, I really enjoyed it. Had a lot of fun. Thank you so much for coming on Futures Radio Show. Well, it's a real pleasure for me to be here, Anthony. You know, Futures Radio is one of uh, half a dozen or so really great fantastic financial podcast. There's only a few of us out there. And you know, what you do is a totally different market segment than Macro Voices, but still, the, uh, the, the top guys in the field are easy to recognize between you and Jesse Felder and, and uh, some of the other guys that are really doing great work. So it's my honor to be on one of the best podcasts in the industry. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you have any questions or comments for myself or my guests, please visit futuresradioshow.com and sign up to be a premium member for free. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes.